Let's just cut to the chase. Every year, the Academy Awards nominates a bunch of films for 24 different categories. In total, there were 53 films that got a nomination in 2020. I have now seen all of them. That's 81 hours of film. So let's do what any sane person would do and rank them all on this episode of Your Everyday Nerd. Racking up three nominations, three more nominations than I should have. Are you an everyday nerd? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next episode. Yo, welcome back to Your Everyday Nerd. I'm your host, Zach Steiner. If you're new around here on Yin, we pull from every corner of nerd culture to talk about anything and everything that piques my interest. We got a lot of films to go through, so let's just jump into it. Life's not fair, is it, my little friend? Number 53, The Lion King, one out of five. Getting only one nomination, the 2019 remake of The Lion King is pretty not good. It's the definition of a soulless cash grab. When it's not imitating a documentary and being boring, it's being laughably bad. Sure, it's pretty sad that this basically takes away from all the creativity the animated original had, but also there's so many missteps here that it makes it such a worse film. A lot of the voice acting is bad, the classic Lion King songs are poorly produced, the characters animations have very little to no expressions. It genuinely makes me wonder who this was made for, because it sure as hell wasn't made for me. I chose the bonne equipe, mon pote. T'as faire aux deux plus gros tocards de la terre, quoi. Regarde ça, quoi. Number 52, Les Miserables, two out of five. This French film named after the classic novel by Victor Hugo was interesting to say the least. I wish there was a good interesting, but it's not. Inspired by the 2005 Paris riots, this film showcases how one event can downward spiral into chaos. In many ways, this film has a very warranted buildup. The third act is definitely more bombastic than the first two acts. Unfortunately, most of the movie is just boring and the ambiguous ending does very little for me. On a technical level, this film is solid enough, but for a movie that was an hour and 45 minutes, it's crazy how little I have to say about this. Why didn't she complain, really? He means the anonymous hotline. The There's hotline. a hotline? Yeah. Number 51, Bombshell, 2.5 out of 5. Racking up three nominations, three more nominations than I should have, Bombshell is a painstakingly boring movie about the 2016 Fox News sexual assault scandal. Now, should stories about this topic be told? Absolutely. Should they be told in this way? Absolutely not. It's enough for a movie to be boring, but it's even more so frustrating because it is about Fox News during the 2016 presidential election. So watching this made me want to die. No, I wasn't really asking. Nor was I. Number 50, Maleficent, Mistress of Evil, 2.5 out of 5. The most frustrating thing about having to watch the second Maleficent movie for a video is that it required a viewing of the first Maleficent movie. Now that movie, that movie was okay. It was a solid enough different perspective of the Sleeping Beauty story, a story which I thought was pretty boring to begin with. In fact, I'd even argue that I enjoyed 2014 Maleficent over the original Disney animated Sleeping Beauty. With that said, this sequel, Mistress of Evil, which was nominated for makeup and hairstyling only, was not good. It attempts to make an original story with these characters and fails in every way. Basically, this is just an even more boring and overly bloated version of the first Maleficent. I mean, this was an almost two hour film with a ton of subplots that I simply didn't care about. Right, I'll come. Boom, there we go. This kid is so lit. Number 49, Breakthrough, 2.5 out of five. As a Christian, I've seen a lot of faith-based films over the years, and Breakthrough doesn't do much for me. It's extremely predictable, the acting was mostly just okay, especially when the best actors were Topher Grace and the Allstate guy. I'm not kidding, the Allstate guy is in this movie. As a positive, I never felt like the film was too preachy, which is a common complaint for films like this, but overall, it really wasn't anything special to me, and I can't even remember the song that it was nominated for. Comedy is subjective, Murray. Isn't that what they say? Number 48, Joker, 2.5 out of 5. Joker's fine. It's a dumb comic book movie that's trying not to be a comic book movie by saying that it has a message that doesn't really exist. I've talked about it in a full length video. I've ranked it in my best picture nominee video. I don't think it deserved 11 nominations, but if you want to hear my full thoughts, go check out one of those videos. One, two, and three, and four, and... Number 47, Walk, Run, Cha Cha, three out of five. One of the first documentaries on this list, Walk Run Cha Cha, is about a Vietnamese couple who has found a passion in dancing in their older age. It's cute for what it is, but even at 20 minutes, I felt like it went on for far too long. It's 
Especially since it doesn't have much substance. Somewhere over the rainbow. Number 46, Judy, three out of five. Judy is all about the life of Judy Garland, who played Dorothy in the original Wizard of Oz. It's a sad, true story about an actress who was taken advantage of as a kid, and at its core, it definitely has potential. Unfortunately, it's boring. I do like the scenes of Judy as a kid, but that's mainly just because I love The Wizard of Oz. Renee Zellweger is really the only part of this film that I would argue is good, but even then, I never really thought her performance was enough to warrant a watch. I am not good a lot here from now. Good. Number 45, Honeyland, three out of five. The first feature length documentary on this list, Honeyland portrays the life of a beekeeper who lives in a remote village in North Macedonia. I knew nothing about beekeeping or Macedonia before this documentary. And honestly, I didn't really learn much about either of them while watching it either, which is a bit of a shame because I feel like I should learn something when I watch a documentary. With that said, this is an interesting slice of life film that is pretty heartbreaking to watch. This woman lives with her bedridden mother and makes a living from beekeeping. Throughout the dock, a family with children moves in next to her, and they basically destroy her bees, leaving her by herself with no way to survive. Fortunately, the producers of the film bought her a house after they finished filming, but watching Honeyland just leaves you with sadness, and not much else. My name is Elson Hercules John, and I'm an alcoholic. Number 44, Rocket Van, 3 out of 5. Nominated for its original song, I'm Gonna Love Me Again, this biopic about Elton John is part fact, part fiction, and a decent amount of fun. There's a lot of dope surrealist elements scattered throughout this film, and I really enjoyed that. I think if you're a big fan of Elton John, this would be higher on your list, but I don't really have a lot of experience with his music, so it goes a little lower for me. Number 43, The Edge of Democracy, 3 out of 5. The Edge of Democracy is a pretty interesting documentary about the felling government of Brazil. Unfortunately, it does fall a bit flat. The first half is pretty straightforward and it's fairly clear what the narrative is, but once you find out that Brazil's government has had a ton of wild turns in the past decade, it just becomes harder and harder to comprehend everything that happened. I'm still not 100% sure why their president was sentenced to 12 years of prison, but then again, he seemed just as confused himself, so I don't know. This was a weird watch. If you're interested in world politics, definitely give this a watch. Otherwise, I just know that I can now put Brazil on the list of governments that piss me off because they can't take care of their people properly. Is that the guy? Yeah. Did he shave his head? Number 42, The Neighbor's Window, three out of five. One of our first short films on the list, The Neighbor's Window is a poignant little film about perspective. I don't want to spoil it because I do think it's worth watching. In fact, it did win the short film award. I'll just say that it was sweet. And while I did enjoy it, it was very predictable and I got a lot more out of the other short films. I'm only free or die. <laughs> Number 41, Harriet, three out of five. Harriet is a pretty okay biopic about Harriet Tubman. I think my problem with this film is that it takes such an amazing and fascinating story and does such a fine C plus job with it. Cynthia Erivo was great and so was Janelle Monet, but the rest of the cast was just fine. Some of the cinematography was nice, but then some of it just ended up being bland. I feel like there was a lot of foundational pieces missing in this film. Also, they give Harriet Tubman precognition superpowers, so that was an interesting decision. At the end of the day, like most 6 out of 10 biopics, Harriet is the perfect film teachers can show in social studies classes. Number 40, Life Overtakes Me, 3 out of 5. Another short documentary, Life Overtakes Me, is about a rare disorder that's happening in Sweden to children who undergo stress ending up in comas. It's crazy that I haven't heard anything about this before, so just watching it to learn about it was enough for me. As far as the technical aspect, it was well made, but I do wish they had gone a bit more in depth about the disorder. This is one of the short docs that I think could have been a feature length film. <laughs> Number 39, Star Wars Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, 3.5 out of 5. At this point, Star Wars could be lower on the list, but I don't feel like rewatching it, so this is my thoughts. Basically, this movie kinda epic, but it also has a ton of issues. Pacing is bad, fan service is pretty much undeserved, almost none of the characters have satisfying endings except for Kylo and Rey. This did get a nomination for visual effects, because of course it did, but the nomination for best original score is a bit baffling to me, because this was easily the most derivative soundtrack in the entire Star Wars franchise. Anyways, frick Star Wars, I'm done, let's move on. 
فكرة انتقالنا لتحت الأرض فكرة بسيطة Number 38, The Cave, three out of five. In the documentary category, there were two documentaries about the current situation happening in Syria. These were For Sama and this film, The Cave. Both of them are good in their own rights, and I'm glad that more people are being aware of what's happening over there, but I couldn't help compare this one to For Sama, which obviously will be higher on my list. When I finished watching For Sama, I had a lot of emotions, anger, sadness, a bit of hope, but overall I was just amazed at how much of a hellhole Syria had become. That filmmaker was able to mix together a very personal story with the town that she lived in with the current conflict, and it was masterfully well done. When it comes to the cave though, I definitely felt similar emotions, but as a documentary, I didn't feel as if there was as much substance here. Scenes kind of just happen in a way without much of a narrative. It left me wanting more of that personal touch that For Sama had. That doesn't mean this isn't worth watching though. I think it works as a great companion piece to For Sama, but on its own, there just isn't as much there. Number 37, Daughter, three out of five. The first animated short film on this list, Daughter is a heartbreaking story that has some really great stop motion animation and some really interesting camera work. Unfortunately, that camera work, while interesting, has a shaky cam aesthetic, which makes it a bit hard to follow its narrative. So for that reason, this ended up being my least favorite animated short. But I'm extremely proud of the people that work in this plant here. Number 36, American Factory, three out of five. American Factory is a documentary that does two things. One, it showcases two cultures coming together and working in the same environment. And two, it showcases the need for unions. Employees should come together and ensure that they have proper working environments. It's a bit of a rough film to watch at first because you're constantly getting angry at different types of people throughout the viewing. Whether it's upper management who has no remorse for their employees, condescending Americans who swear that they're in the right even when they're not. Have you heard of Wheaties cereal? I don't know. You ever heard Wheaties. of Wheaties? Wheaties, I don't know. Wheaties. Yeah, buddy. Wheaties. W-E-D-S. W-E-E-T-E-S. The Chinese government for instilling a near suicidal work ethic in their people, American politicians, billionaires, the list really goes on. Long story short, this is a documentary that definitely delivers on its premise. It's fairly interesting, albeit a bit boring at times, but it wasn't a complete waste of my time. A tyranny of unfair economic structures. Number 35, The Two Popes, three out of five. The Two Popes is about, you guessed it, two popes. In 2012, there was a lot of controversy in the Catholic Church, and one of the most respected cardinals wanted to retire. Although, after talking to the pope in charge at the time, the cardinal decided not to retire and instead take his place as the pope. It's kind of a biopic, though for the most part, I felt like I was watching a documentary here. In other words, I wanted to go night-night. But thankfully, the fantastic performances from Anthony Hopkins and Jonathan Price kept me invested enough to see it through to the end. It's not an amazing film, though I do think it was close to being something special. It was just something missing for me. My penmanship isn't great, but, uh, you know, opposable thumbs and... Number 34, Missing Link, three out of five. Do you want a decent family film with a predictable plot? Well, then do I have the film for you? Missing Link is good. Like, there's nothing about it that I would say is bad. It was just missing something. No, honestly, it's a stop motion film from the same studio that made these movies, so the animation is impressive. I like the main character, who's a Bigfoot named Susan. He has some funny moments, and all the voice actors are solid. There's nothing else I can say about it. If you got kids around, I guess there are far worse animated films out there. I just wish this wasn't as forgettable as it was. Do you ever worry about the notion that nothing is permanent? Number 33, Frozen 2, 3.5 out of 5. Frozen 2 is a strange Disney film for me. Because on one hand, I definitely enjoyed a lot that it had going on. But on the other hand, there are some bigger picture things that I mixed on. I enjoyed the first Frozen. I thought it had a pretty decent story, great soundtrack, good bit of charm. And I think Frozen 2 takes all of that charm and it goes in such a wildly different direction. It turns out that Frozen 2 is unironically epic. The art direction and animation is absolutely breathtaking at times. The journey these characters go on have tremendous highs and lows. We get themes of change, maturity, and even death and depression. But then everything else just kind of happens. Happens. Main characters from the first film get sidelined. There's this nature versus society plot thread that felt similar to Princess Mononoke, and then they don't really do anything with it. There's also a lot of subplots. I don't know. I guess overall, this is a film with a lot of promise that just barely missed its full potential. Number 32, Brotherhood, 3.5 out of 5. Set in Tunisia, Brotherhood is a tense 25 minutes that I could not look away from. 
It's got some great cinematography. I was hooked on its plot and characters, and similar to the other short film, I don't want to say much about it because it would spoil it. The only reason this isn't higher for me is because the story feels a bit rushed. I feel like this easily could have been a feature length film and it would have sold the ending just a bit more. But that said, it's still definitely worth watching. If you would have told me four years ago that I'd be a state representative, I probably would have cussed you out about three different languages. <laughs> Number 31, St. Louis Superman, 3.5 out of 5. Another short documentary, St. Louis Superman is about Bruce Franks Jr., a 34-year-old battle rapper who becomes a state representative for St. Louis, Missouri. This is an incredible look into an interesting man that makes a real difference in the world. It's not my favorite of the short docs, but I'm really glad this was made and I hope it inspires more young people to take initiative in their community. I'm calling you a hero. Do you feel like one? No, ma'am. I feel like uh, I was a person. Number 30, Richard Jewell, 3.5 out of 5. The latest film from Clint Eastwood, Richard Jewell is a wild and story about a man who stopped a terrorist attack only to then be accused by the media of causing that same terrorist attack. This is a pretty decent enough film. The cast is really the strong suit here. Sam Rockwell, Kathy Bates, Olivia Wilde, all great. Paul Walker Hauser plays the titular Richard Jewell, whose performance is fantastic. The movie's a bit on the longer side and it is very predictable, especially since it's based on a real event. Plus the direction isn't anything to write home about. So it's definitely one of the more forgettable films on this list, but I didn't dislike it or anything. They're not long gone. Number 29, 1917, 3.5 out of 5. One of the best picture nominees of 2020, 1917, a war film directed by Sam Mendes, is so epic in the context of, I felt like I was watching a two hour video game cutscene. I talked about this in length already in two videos, but I won't spend much time on it right now, but I enjoyed this ethereal soundtrack by Thomas Newman. Roger Deakin's cinematography is obviously top notch. It's a stylistic masterpiece. Unfortunately, the story was kind of boring and I feel no need to return to this in the future. Feel the tank. Number 28, Ford v Ferrari, 3.5 out of 5. Another Best Picture nominee, James Mangold's Ford v Ferrari, is a film that I've come around to liking the more and more I think about it. I still don't think it's perfect, it's another very predictable narrative, but it's got impeccable sound design. Christian Bell and Matt Damon are great leads, and anytime they film the racing scenes, it's really quite beautiful. I still don't think this is an amazing film by any means, but I actually can see myself watching this again at some point in the future. Number 27, Kid Bull, 4 out of 5. Another one of our animated shorts, Kid Bull is a Disney Plus original that is simply just cute and sad. Disney really knows how to play with your emotions. Not much to say about this one. Go see it if you haven't already. Number 26, Nefta Football Club, 4 out of 5. Another short film, Nefta Football Club, is a story of two brothers who find a lost donkey in the middle of the desert. That donkey is carrying a certain cargo of white powder, which the older brother quickly realizes that he can sell to make a fortune. A couple of events happen, things don't quite turn out how he planned them to go, and the ending of the short left me with my mouth wide open right after immediately bursting into laughter. This was definitely the funniest short film of the year. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Number 25, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, 4 out of 5. When I first saw that there was going to be a Mr. Rogers film starring Tom Hanks, I was a little bit concerned, but honestly, I really quite liked this. Instead of your traditional biopic, here we get a mixture of a Mr. Rogers episode and a narrative about a man who is interviewing him for a newspaper article. Honestly, this is a strangely perfect blend of childhood nostalgia and heartfelt drama. Tom Hanks plays Mr. Rogers exceptionally well. The establishing shots utilize dioramas like the original show. The soundtrack is this beautiful jazz piano. This film just exudes charm. And while it may not be perfect, it's definitely doing something original. I mean, he's right about all of this. It does seem like the whole world knows about us now. Number 24, How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, four out of five. While it's been a while since I've watched the first two films in this trilogy, I can say without a doubt that The Hidden World is a perfect end to the trilogy. I'll eventually do some DreamWorks videos in the future, so I'll talk about this more then, but I was pleasantly surprised at just how beautiful this film was. Number 23, learning to skateboard in a war zone if you're a girl, four out of five. This short documentary won this year, and with a title as epic as this, there's really no surprise there. This is a neat short that is inspiring. It's hopeful. It do be sad considering it tells the story of young Afghan girls who are learning to read, write, and skateboard in the middle of an actual war zone. As far as a piece of film, it's pretty cool, but it's so much cooler that these women are becoming educated, taking up a hobby despite their circumstances. 
Las noches que coinciden varios dolores, esas noches creo en Dios. Number 22, Pain and Glory, four out of five. Pain and Glory is a mostly autobiographical depiction of a filmmaker dealing with his mortality. This film does have a few issues, mainly in its pacing, but with the fantastic performance from Antonio Banderas and its unique presentation using color, motion graphics, and other visual concepts, I really did find this to be such a captivating watch. Also, the last 30 seconds, uh, it's brilliant. I'd honestly recommend this movie alone for its ending. Seriously, go watch it. Number 21, Saria, four out of five. Saria is another short film based off of a real life event where 41 young orphans tragically died in a fire in 2017. I don't have much to say about this one, but it just goes to show you there's always some kind of messed up thing happening somewhere. And honestly, that's just really, really sad. Kudos to the filmmakers for making me aware of this event. I'm taking you back. Number 20, Ad Astra, four out of five. There's no shortage of space sci-fi films, and I can't say that Brad Astor did anything particularly special, but Brad Pitt has quickly become one of my favorite actors of all time, and he takes this pretty decent sci-fi film and puts it up a notch for me. On a technical level, this film is masterful. The utilization of CGI and sound design really makes you feel like you're alone in space. Unfortunately, the story is a bit lackluster. There's also a couple of strange action scenes that come out of nowhere, one that reminded me of Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase. But I will say this, this film will probably be more relatable to a lot of people now since it deals with themes of isolation. It's not amazing, but I still enjoyed it nonetheless. All it takes is some confidence and a willingness to get started. Number 19, Hair Love. Four out of five. Hair Love is a cute short film that I'm really glad won the best animated short film category. I'm more than certain that a lot of children and a lot of dads will feel empowered after watching this one. Désolé, pas pu te rappeler plus tôt. Number 18, A Sister, four out of five. My favorite of the short films, A Sister is a gripping 16 minute short about a woman who is in danger. I was tense throughout this entire thing. And again, I don't want to spoil it, so go check it out. What Congratulations, <laughs> you are now a postman. Number 17, Klaus, 4.5 out of five. A fun and heartwarming family film, Klaus takes on a charming and innovative approach to the Santa Claus story with beautiful animation and a great cast. This is one of the first Christmas films that I've seen in a while. It was genuinely great. Highly recommend it. It's okay. Come on out. That's it. Come on. There you go. <sighs> Number 16, Toy Story 4, 4.5 out of five. It's been a long time since I've seen a Toy Story film, so it took me a while to watch Toy Story 4, but this was a fun movie. I really enjoyed the humor. Key and Pill aren't in here too much, but they had me dying. It's a visually impressive film. The score is great. I love all the new characters and most of the old characters still have room to shine. The story is predictable, but I like that these characters are still growing, especially Woody. His character arc was a standout here, and it's honestly surprising that they were still able to do something new with Toy Story. Today, I Number 15, Sister, 4.5 out of 5. One of my personal favorites of the animated short films, Sister has a really unique style of animation. The soundtrack is beautiful, and again, it'd be bad for me to spoil this one because the ending hit me hard. Definitely go check it out. So what happens? I'm gonna give you an emergency shot of Naloxon so you don't die in 10 minutes. Number 14, Knives Out, 4.5 out of 5. Knives Out is a super fun murder mystery with a stacked cast of unbelievably good actors that still manages to have a bunch of twists and turns. The first 20 minutes are a bit slow, and Daniel Craig with a southern accent is really weird. My presence will be ornamental. But after that, this film goes places, and I really look forward to rewatching it and seeing the sequel in the near future. I don't think I can do this. Russ? Of course you can. Number 13, Jojo Rabbit, 4.5 out of 5. Another Best Picture nominee, Jojo Rabbit is fantastic. This parody of World War II Germany is a bit of a shock at first, but Taika Waititi handles the subject matter very well. There's some great comedic bits, the casting is perfect, both Scarlett Johansson and Roman Griffin Davis do an outstanding job. Overall, I'll definitely be watching this again in the future. Daddy? Yes, Nofen? How do you get to fly? Number 12, I Lost My Body. 4.5 out of 5. My personal favorite animated film of the year, I Lost My Body is a stunning animated film with a beautiful score and a really captivating story. Not much to say here, it was just really good and you should go watch it. Number 13, 
Number 11, Corpus Christi, 4.5 out of 5. One of our foreign film nominees, Corpus Christi is a pretty tight, engaging story about a 20-year-old convict who wants to be a Catholic priest. After getting out of jail, our main character dresses up as a priest and takes over a local church. It's a great film. I haven't heard many people talk about it, so here's me talking about it. Now go watch it. Oh, God. Bruce. Damn. Number 10, Avengers Endgame, 4.5 out of 5. It's Avengers Endgame. I really can't rank this any lower than I already have. It capstones an entire 10 year old cinematic experience. Yes, it's got problems. That second act is way too long. I haven't rewatched it nearly as much as Infinity War. But like, who honestly cares? That last hour is freaking amazing. This is officially the one and only time that Marvel gets a pass out of me. When I was young, I, I thought I was paint this painted houses. Number nine, The Irishman, 4.5 out of five. Kind of like the Avengers Endgame of Martin Scorsese crime epics, The Irishman is a 3.5 hour film that I really enjoyed. You could make the argument that it's too long, but I disagree. I don't think anything could have been cut to make it shorter. I love that it chronicles decades of these characters' lives. I love that Frank Sheeran has this detachment to the mob lifestyle. While it's not my favorite Scorsese film now that I've seen more of his work, it's still a really good time. Quel drôle de question. Nous sommes en 1965. Number eight, Memorable, five out of five. Memorable is an unbelievably animated short about dementia. I can't even begin to understand what it's like for someone who is losing their reality, but this short gives me a glimpse into what that might look like, and it's heartbreaking. Memorable is my personal pick for best animated short. <laughs> Number seven, In the Absence, five out of five. Another depressing short, In the Absence is a documentary about a ferry that sunk off the coast of South Korea in 2014. 300 people were on board, most of them being school children, and it took years for the victims' families and survivors to get any kind of justice from the situation. As a documentary, this was very informative, definitely engaging, but man, this sucked to watch. We will now be putting South Korea on the list of governments I'm pissed at for not helping their people. Did you want to die? Number six, Four Sama, five out of five. I briefly mentioned Four Sama earlier, and yeah, it's the best documentary on this list. Following a detailed first person perspective into the Syrian refugee struggle, you have to make a point to watch this to understand just how bad the Syrian issue is. You're a great deal too good for me, and, I, and I'm so grateful to you, and I'm so proud of you, and I just... Number five, Little Women, 4.5 out of five. Okay, we can now talk about some lighter stuff now. Little Women is an adaptation of the Louisa May Alcott story, and it's great. I really love this film. Greta Gerwig is such a great director, only two films in. I love the casting here. The narrative is told in two different points in time, which is really dope. Like the other Best Picture nominees, I did an entire video on this one, so go check that out for more thoughts. Blow out the candles, Robert, and make a wish. Want something. Want something. Number four, Marriage Story, five out of five. Oh, we're gonna talk about divorce now. Marriage Story is another Best Picture nom, and it also is great. Directed by Noah Baumbach, this film really makes you feel like you're getting divorced too. The interactions can be sweet, it can be upsetting, it can be very uncomfortable. From the very beginning to the very end, you know what you're in for, but it's never boring. Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson both do a fantastic job here, and I couldn't recommend this more. What I always say, most important thing in this town is when you're making money, you buy a house in town, you don't rent. Number three, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, five out of five. My first Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is so good. I like two things here a lot. Number one, the atmosphere. Set in 1960s Hollywood, the sounds, the visuals, everything feels like that time period. And number two, the friendship between Rick and Cliff. Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio are great throughout this whole thing. They're both fun to watch. The dialogue is snappy and fun. Oh, and that ending, it's wild, and it makes the first couple of hours of build up even better. You don't know what you're talking. How can I possibly like the horse you fix us for supper? You're drunk. I Number two, The Lighthouse, five out of five. The Lighthouse is a masterpiece. There's not much else to say. Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe have outstanding chemistry. These are career defining performances from both of them. The script feels like a Shakespeare play. There's so much to dissect and analyze. Like I could do an entire video on this easily. This is a funny film. There's so many good comedic moments. The cinematography, the choice to do black and white, the aspect ratio, all goes hand in hand with creating such an immersive period piece that I need to rewatch a few more times before I do make a video on this. Number one, Parasite, five out of five. 
I've seen Parasite three times now and it still blows my mind. This genre bending political thematic film does everything right. People will be talking about Parasite for years to come. I love how many times this movie made me think, excuse me, what? Narratively, I thought it would go in one place and then it ended up going in an entirely different place altogether. There's certain scenes that are just embedded in my mind because of how good they are. The entire cast is phenomenal. The cinematography is noticeably on another level. I could talk about this film for ages, but I won't because I already did a video on it already. And after 53 films, I'd say that I've talked enough. But that's all the time we have left for today. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave me a like. Let me know down in the comments what were your favorite films of the Oscars 2020s. Please subscribe. We're trying to get to a thousand subs by the end of the summer. And with all that said, I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.